Nicole Burley. It is Thursday, August 19th. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. We have hundreds of reporters spread across the country. This is our News Nation network of stations. And tonight we are also following the latest path of the destructive Calder fire. It's now burning more than 65,000 acres, 0% contained, at least 50 homes destroyed. And that's just so far. And four police officers shot in Albuquerque, one in critical condition after an attempted robbery escalated into gunfires, just the latest instance of police coming under fire across America and an example of that. In Illinois, thousands of officers paying their respects to one of their own gunned down in the line of duty. News Nation takes you inside this memorial service remembering Officer Ella French. But we begin tonight with the pandemic wreaking havoc on Alabama, where right now there are no more ICU beds available across the entire state. Tonight, a rare look inside what's arguably the epicenter of the COVID crisis here in America. News Nation's Devin Walsh from our Mobile, Alabama station WKRG was granted exclusive access to a COVID ward. So Devin, right now, no ICU beds in Alabama. Other southern states are seeing a strain. So we hear about these rising numbers. We see these statistics. Seeing it in person is a completely different thing. Describe what it was like inside that hospital. Oh, that's right, Nicole. We went inside one of the top five busiest hospitals in the state of Alabama for patients being treated for COVID. And you're right. We talk about these numbers. We hear the stories of these patients. But when you walk the halls and you go from room to room in PPE with two masks on and face shields and gowns and have to change clothes 10 different times, it is so stressful for the staff members. And it is devastating to see these patients. Nicole, they are so sick. I can't impress upon people people, how miserable they look. And as the nurses described to me, these patients basically are suffocating. It's horrible. Well, and Devin, we're taking a look at, at some of the footage that you were able to get um, and you described those patients. I know during previous surges, we saw a lot of older people. We saw the immunocompromised. Who are the patients this time around? Well, this time around, they told me it's not just your grandparents. This time, it is people's parents, or it is people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. They are seeing a lot younger patients who are getting sicker a lot faster, and that's the difference here. It's not just people in their 80s and 90s who are dying of COVID. We have young people dying. I interviewed a young man who's 24. He's not going to die, but he said, I wish I'd gotten the vaccine because I didn't know that I was going to be this sick here in the ICU you at this hospital. Well, and speaking uh, you know, of your interviews, I know you had a chance to talk to some patients. You had a chance to talk to relatives of patients. Many of those interviews really resonated with you. Oh, there was one, Nicole, so I want I've got everybody to tell you. to understand that this is not a joke. It's not a hoax. It is serious. And Bailey is a healthy 24-year-old girl. And she's now in ICU. And it's, it all happened in a week. In less than a week. Oh, I'll tell you what, I mean, that is a mother of a 24 year old young woman who is on a ventilator with a collapsed lung who is dying right now. This was a healthy 24 year old and her mom was just crying and trying to tell people this is real. It's not a hoax. Get vaccinated. And Nicole, that's the big problem here. We have over 90% of the people in the hospital are unvaccinated and they are dying. It is real. It is not a hoax. And my last question for you, Devin, we know that um, because there's such a strain on the ICU, other areas of the hospital had to be converted to care for those COVID patients. So what about the other patients? What about the non-COVID patients or the people who are trying to go to the emergency room, for example? Good luck with that is basically what some of the doctors said. We went down to the emergency room and there are patients stacked up in wheelchairs out the door with eight ambulances outside also holding patients. Uh, good luck if you have a heart attack or a stroke. They'll care for you, of course, the best they can. But at this point, they said they're getting to the point of triage medicine. It's almost like a war zone. This is not a good time to get sick in the state of Alabama and have to go to the hospital. I can promise you that. Well, De Devin Walsh from our Mobile, Alabama station, thank you for granting us access to your exclusive footage. We really appreciate it. And of course, we wish the best to the people of Mobile. Well, even as the Delta variant surges nationwide, today the White House reported more than a million new vaccine doses administered, the first time for that one million benchmark in almost seven weeks. But in Mississippi, one of the nation's least vaccinated states, hospitals 
once again overwhelmed the state setting up two COVID field hospitals like the one you see here in just the past week. And state health officials say this surge is impacting younger people. Last week, 13-year-old Michaela Robinson died of COVID just a day after testing positive. She's one of many students who contracted COVID since school started earlier this month. News Nation's Anna Farish from our Jackson station WJTV has the latest on how COVID is impacting those young people in Mississippi. The Smith County School District is shutting down for the next two weeks after an eighth grader died from COVID last week. COVID cases are running rampant through the school district. Over 700 students and staff are under quarantine. This past week, 13 year old Michaela Robinson died after contracting COVID. She was a high school student, one of nearly 6,000 students who've contracted COVID since the start of August. State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs says the Delta variant is unlike anything we've seen so far during the pandemic. It's still being called the pandemic of the unvaccinated. In Mississippi, 98% of COVID cases, 89% of hospitalizations, and 86% of COVID deaths have appeared in people unvaccinated. Just this week, Samaritan's Purse opened up the second COVID field hospital in the state. Dr. Luann Woodward with UMMC says Mississippians are responsible for bringing the state to this point. We have failed to use the tools that we have to protect ourselves, to protect our families, to protect our children, and to protect our state. This time last year in press conferences, we all talked about, boy, if we can just get to that place where we've got a vaccine, we'll get on the other side of this. And what I have to say to the citizens of Mississippi is we have that vaccine, we have that tool, and we have not appropriately and fully used it, and this, is where we are. We do not have to be here, but this is where we are. As COVID continues to rise, so does the demand for COVID testing. The testing center at Trustmark Park just reopened today to help with the demand. For News Nation, I'm Anna Farish. All right, Anna, thank you. Let's switch gears here. This is a live look at the U.S. Capitol after a day of very high tension once again for D.C. police all day. We monitored an hours long standoff near the Capitol and Library of Congress with a man who claimed he had an explosive device. Our authorities are now at that man's North Carolina home. It's just west of Charlotte. So let's go to News Nation's Allison Harris live back at the Capitol with where things stand right now, Allison. Well, Nicole, we just received word from Capitol Police. There were no real explosives inside this man's truck. Police did not find a bomb, despite him telling law enforcement and saying in a Facebook Live that he had a bomb inside of that pickup truck. Police, however, did find bomb-making materials. We know that he was using a whiteboard, writing on a whiteboard to communicate with law enforcement, holding it up so that law enforcement could see through his driver's side window and the front windshield. Uh, police at one point sent a robot to deliver a phone to him. He did not want to use that. Eventually, he got out of his truck, surrendered, and police were able to take him into custody. Once again Thursday, the United States Capitol under potential threat. Capitol police officers scrambling to the scene of a man in a black pickup truck parked on the sidewalk in front of the Library of Congress. The man, now identified as Floyd Roseberry, rambled live on social media. Blood be on your hands. According to this video, he told law enforcement he had a bomb and a detonator with him and that if they shot him, it would go off. The video has since been taken down from Facebook and Instagram. The social media company saying it's in contact with law enforcement. I'm sure they know what it is. Roseberry is from Grover, North Carolina. He has a minor criminal history of larceny, driving without a license, and resisting a public officer, but no criminal charges since the 1990s. Congress is out on recess, but office buildings nearby were evacuated. Staffers told to shelter in place. Those workers still reeling from the trauma of January 6th and the car ramming into security that killed an officer in April. And again, the scene is finally clear here tonight. We don't yet know which charges he could face. And that's because as we speak, Nicole, law enforcement are meeting with the U.S. District Attorney's Office here in D.C. to determine those charges. Nicole? Yeah, very scary situation there. All right, Allison, thank you.
Well, we are following more breaking news. This is just outside of Atlanta. Firefighters rescuing 27 children and four adults from those rising waters. It's at a daycare center due to severe storms. And search efforts underway in Haywood County, North Carolina. After flooding hit the area from remnants of Tropical Storm Fred, two people are dead, 20 others still missing tonight. News Nation's Ayla Farone from our Spartanburg station, WSPA, joining us live. So, Ayla, Federal help is on the way. That's the hope here. I mean, the governor and also Senator Tom Tillis here earlier today, the mayor saying that that federal assistance is crucial for these areas to move forward. Now, you'll see behind me the Pigeon River, and this river flooded over into nearby businesses. One man who owns this brewery that we're standing next to tells me it was like a tidal wave coming over the banks and through his business. You can see these items here. Volunteers have been pouring through them all day, pulling out mud-covered items just like these ones and Canton was not the only town affected here in the western part of the state. Check out these aerial photos that show the greater part of this area underwater just after that flooding. It gives you an idea of the work here still left to be done. Senator Tom Tillis and Governor Roy Cooper both came to survey the damage Thursday afternoon. They say this will be crucial in getting federal emergency funding to help people here. And as I mentioned before, the Canton mayor is also pushing for this help. Now, meanwhile, the search efforts are still underway for those 20 people who are missing. Luckily, some were able to be reunited with their families. But the sheriff tells us that they are actually checking out some of the vehicles that were swept away by that flooding to see if there are any people still inside of them. Meanwhile, the governor says they're actually going to be using cell phone tracking to try and find some of those missing people as well. I'm live in Haywood County. Ayla Farone, Nicole, back to you. Yeah, Ayla, those are Horrible, horrible pictures. Excellent reporting, though. Thank you so much. All right, well, from one extreme to another, the wildfires ravaging the West are far from over. Crews struggling to battle the Dixie Fire. It's California's largest single wildfire in state history. Starting back in early July, it's burned through more than 1,000 square miles, destroying 1,200 buildings. And listen to this, more than half of those buildings were homes. One Cal Fire chief says it's not going to end anytime soon. And now the newer Calder Fire is adding to the pressure for those fire crews. It's burned less, though, about 65,000 acres, but right now, 0% contained. And as it grows, it's reducing homes and cars to this. That's just melted rubble and ash. Thousands are being ordered to evacuate tonight. It was very scary, and you don't know how you're going to feel until you're driving away and you look at your house and everything that you know you couldn't take hits your heart. Oh, it really does. Well, long-lasting drought conditions combined with high winds, dry heat are stoking fears that more fires could pop up. So let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon. He's for us down in the Weather Center. Albert, we know those flames forcing people from their homes, but the smoke really causing some problems too. Yeah, widespread air quality issues over central and northern California. I want to show you current air quality first, and the worst air quality in the entire United States is in northern California or south central Washington because of ongoing wildfires. And this is a look at the forecast for air quality. And notice whenever you see these purple little blobs start to pop up over the next 24 hours, that is showing not just poor, but hazardous air quality where we have those active fires burning right now, Caldor fire as well as the Dixie fire. The good news is the wind's coming down. The bad news is there's just no rain in the forecast for at least the next week. Now to tropical weather. This is Henri, 65 mile per hour tropical storm off the southeast coast, drifting off to the east now, but headed northbound starting tomorrow. And this is when we have to start watching late in the weekend into Monday for possible tropical impacts in southeast New England, included in this cone for a potential strong tropical storm or Cat 1 hurricane, places like Boston, Portland, Maine. So again, Sunday into Monday, we need to watch for impacts from Henri. Rain up to five inches could be possible, Nicole. So much severe weather. All right, Albert, thank you. Well, four New Mexico police officers are hurt, one critically after a shooting. Investigators say those officers we're responding to a robbery when the shots rang out. News Nation's Stephanie Chavez from our Albuquerque station, KRQE, joining us live. So, Stephanie, what happened here? 
Nicole, you can see that there's still a really big police presence as police continue to gather that evidence this evening. Uh, the chief told us this morning that police were responding to the Dutch Bros Coffee right behind me uh, with reports of a robbery call. Once they arrived on scene, those suspects started to open fire. One of the officers was hit in the chest just above his bulletproof vest. That's the officer that is in critical condition at UNMH. We are still waiting to get word on his condition at this hour. The other three officers, on the other hand, one of them was shot in the arm. The other was shot in the chest. However, his vest did stop the bullet. And a fourth officer was hurt by flying shrapnel or glass. Now, again, we're still waiting to hear back on the condition of those four officers. One of the suspects was shot on scene. There's no word on their condition this evening. The other suspect, however, took off on foot and after an hour's long search that shut down the entire area, including businesses and local schools, that suspect was finally taken into custody, but there's no word yet on where he was located. Again, we're still waiting to hear back from APD about the, the condition of those four officers and how they're recovering this evening. Yeah, we certainly hope that they will be okay. All right, Stephanie, thank you for that. Well, we also know two police officers in San Bernardino, California, are recovering after being shot. This happened as they were trying to arrest a man suspected of shooting a deputy earlier in the week. The gunman was ultimately killed in a shootout with SWAT officers. One of the wounded officers did leave the hospital today, but the other is still being treated. Investigators also say the deputy wounded earlier this week on Tuesday is expected to make a full recovery. But meantime, a very somber day in Chicago as police officers laid one of their own to rest. Funeral services today for Officer Ella French. She was gunned down during a traffic stop in a city struggling to deal with gun violence. News Nation's Felicia Bolton has more on this tragic story. And Felicia, thousands turned out to honor Officer French. That's right. It was very heartbreaking today. Amid a wave of summer gun violence across the country, today was the final goodbye for that Chicago police officer gunned down in the line of duty. A final farewell for fallen Officer Ella French brings thousands of men and women in blue together and leaves her mother with a deep void. I have two children. Ella and Andrew, they are my heart. Today I am here with half my heart. We sat and played and talked, at least I did, a while to get to know each other. Then you smiled. It was a smile that lit up your face, my home, and captured my heart. I knew then that God willing, you would be my daughter forever. The baby girl she adopted, dead at just 29. Chicago police say French was shot multiple times when a routine traffic stop turned into a deadly encounter. Her partner survived. Thank you for your support, and your donations, and your prayers. For French's family and comrades, they are praying her loss will not be in vain and her legacy will live on through the people she touched. Ella, you're a great police officer, friend, and partner. Thank you for all the great members. I miss you. A hero, friend, and daughter gone too soon is finally laid to rest. I close with the words I always told Ella as she had it into work. Be careful. And the court is blocking investigators from releasing the body cam video in that deadly shooting of Chicago police officer Ella French. The judge says the video cannot be released under the city's transparency policy or any Freedom of Information Act request. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability says it is committed to releasing all material related to this shooting once the judge lifts the court order. All right, so Felicia, the big question, well, when could that happen? Well, as of right now, there is no timeline given for that, Nicole. All right, Felicia, thank you. Let's tell ahead tonight on Rush Hour. Hundreds of Afghans pouring out of the country days after the Taliban takeover. How many Americans are still there and why not all of them may get a flight back? And the feds cracking down on unruly airline passengers, more than $1 million in fines for people who refuse to wear masks or 
got violent with flight attendants. Which passengers were hit with the biggest bills? In the midst of the pandemic, misbehaving airline passengers are giving rise to a new air travel slogan, flying the unfriendly skies. And the fines for their bad behavior was producing and it's really beginning to pile up those fines are. So just what are the airlines dealing with out there? News Nation's Tom Negevin is live tonight at JFK International Airport in New York. So Tom, a lot of people would say these fines are a long time coming. You know, and they're adding up, Nicole, in a big way. The uh, Federal Aviation Administration announcing another half million dollars worth a day, bringing the total on the year to date to over a million dollars. The highest uh, are a couple of fines in the 40s. We'll tell you about here in just a sec. But the FAA says, look, this is all part of its effort to crack down on growing bad behavior in the air. And yes, as you put it so well, the unfriendly skies. In one of the recent incidents, a man threw his carry-on bag at fellow passengers, uh, put his head up the skirt of a flight attendant before he was restrained with plastic ties, hogtied basically, and hauled down the center aisle and just dragged away, arrested. That's the $45,000 fine. That's the big one, the largest one. The other um, big one, $42,000, involves a man who refused to wear a mask, touched at least one of his female passengers and made stabbing gestures towards some of the other passengers who then armed themselves with ice mallets for their own protection before the law caught up with him and he was hauled away by crew members and police. The FAA said this week that the airlines have reported about 3,900 incidents on the year to date, just shy of that, of unruly passengers. About 75% of those involve people who don't want to wear their masks, but you may not be surprised to know that alcohol is involved in uh, most of the other 25% of those cases. And today, American Airlines, in a related development, extended its ban on alcohol sales in in the main cabin to January 18th with matches federal mask mandates on flights. And tonight, the union representing flight attendant says this is great, praising the FAA, but saying it wants more, more criminal prosecutions, which is outside the FAA's purview. Nearly one uh, in five American flight attendants, U.S. flight attendants, say they have witnessed or been victim of incidents, physical incidents involving passengers this year, uh, many of whom they say were triggered by the mask mandate or a lack of alcohol being served on their flights, Nicole. Oh my God, it almost makes me wonder, Tom, if at some point we're all going to have to take anger management classes before we can board planes. It I might mean, be this time. is just ridiculous. Yeah. All right, Tom, thank you. Let's tell ahead why the world's largest car maker is slashing production nearly in half and why it looks like more companies may soon do the same. Plus, police releasing some disturbing body camera footage showing officers repeatedly punching, even spitting on a group of teenagers. Tonight, how the department is responding to accusations of excessive force. Welcome back. Here's a look at what's happening in your nation right now. A school district in central Mississippi shutting down after losing a student to COVID-19. 13-year-old Michaela Robinson passed away on Saturday, not even a week after being diagnosed with the virus. Her parents say the eighth grader did not have any underlying conditions. District officials report more than 100 positive cases on Tuesday alone. But tonight on News Nation Prime, that girl's father opens up about his tragic loss, his message to everyone about COVID. That's coming up at 9, 8 central, right here on News Nation. A North Carolina man in custody after claiming to have a bomb in his pickup truck outside the Library of Congress, resulting in an hours long standoff. It prompted a massive police response. Look at this. Several evacuated buildings in the area, which is near the U.S. Capitol. Police say that suspect, 49 year old Floyd Ray Roseberry, live streamed much of the episode on Facebook. Neither charges nor a motive have been announced. And two people are dead, 20 still missing in North Carolina. After flooding from remnants of tropical storm Fred, hundreds of families are displaced, roads are flooded, bridges are washed out. Right now, 
Search crews are still looking for victims and survivors. And 14 train cars derailed this morning east of Indianapolis. Look at that, ripping up 100 feet of track, damaging nearby power lines. Some of the cars were filled with mixed freight. That's also known as used cooking oil and plastic pellets. Residents in the area were forced to evacuate, but luckily, no one is hurt. An alleged victim of R. Kelly continued her testimony at the singer's sex trafficking trial today in New York. Geronda Pace, a minor at the time of the alleged incidents, claimed Kelly would sometimes demand she wear pigtails and dress like a Girl Scout during sexual encounters he would then record. Kelly's defense team attempted to cast her as an opportunistic groupie. More alleged victims are set to testify in the coming weeks. We're shifting now to the latest out of Afghanistan, where the U.S. military ramping up efforts to evacuate as many people as quickly as possible. Huge crowds of Afghans lining the tarmacs, hoping for space on a plane leaving Afghanistan. The process constrained by Taliban checkpoints surrounding the airport and paperwork problems among Afghans, hoping to prove they have the needed documentation. And another day of unprecedented protests against the new Taliban regime today actually marks Afghanistan's Independence Day from Britain. But the day's message much more focused on the Taliban, which broke up the demonstration using violence. Meanwhile, chaos at the Kabul airport as U.S. troops try to maintain calm and control in the face of a sea of Afghans hoping to evacuate. And heart-wrenching scenes like this. Parents lifting their children over a wall at the airport, handing them off to a U.S. soldier in hopes of getting that child to safety. The State Department working to provide frequent updates on how many people are being airlifted out of Afghanistan and how many are still waiting for a seat on a plane. News Nation's Joe Khalil live tonight in D.C. Joe, what's the latest on this evacuation effort? I mean, it's still one of the largest evacuation efforts that uh, we've ever seen. In just the last 24 hours, the State Department says uh, those C-17 planes, the ones that we've probably all seen images of now with hundreds of people packed inside of them, they say that 12 have gone out of Afghanistan in just the last 24 hours, about 2,000 people total uh, on those planes leaving the country. Now, we're not exactly sure how many uh, were Afghans and how many were Americans, but here's what we do know from the State Department is that so far in the last five days, they say that 7,000 people have already been airlifted out of Afghanistan, and we know that 6,000 people are, they say, processed and ready to go, many of them already uh, at the Kabul airport. Now, in terms of just the refugee population, uh, we know 2,000 is the latest number we got that have already landed here uh, in the United States, and that there are plans for at least 800 more of those special immigrant visa cases that are coming very soon. Uh, here at Dulles Airport, we've seen uh, already a group of American troops that have just come off a plane. Uh, there are people here who are waiting for uh, family members as well. We know we've talked to some of the Afghan refugees uh, yesterday and again today that came through Dulles here. Uh, so this thing continues. Many of them are going to be settled in places like California. One man told us Kansas, even in the D.C. area. So they are going to be settled uh, throughout the United States. But that's the latest picture, Nicole, coming uh, from the State Department on that massive effort. Yeah, lots of relief for those families coming in. All right, Joe, thank you. Well, the global pandemic and a shortage of computer chips making it a tough few months for automakers, U.S. car sales down in July for a third straight month, and now a troubling sign from one of the world's top manufacturers. News Asian correspondent Nancy Liu joining us live in Culver City, California. So, Nancy, what is Toyota saying? Well, Nicole, it is a production slowdown already. There's not enough supply to meet demand. So even though prices are up, overall sales are down because there's not enough inventory for people to buy. The announcement by Toyota indicates that the supply will soon get even tighter. For months, Toyota was able to weather the global semiconductor shortage due to earlier stockpiling through established Asian suppliers. But now COVID-19 has weakened the supply chain, forcing a production slowdown in Japan and North America. With the chip shortage, you're going to see companies like Toyota pull back, scale back their uh, production volume a little bit. But they're going to be okay because at the end of the year, when chips start coming back into the market, they're going to be in a much better position to put new vehicles on the market. 
Toyota calls the situation fluid and complex, but due to shortages, production at its North American plants will mean up to 90,000 fewer vehicles this month, and the projection for next month is a reduction of 80,000. What's available now will likely go fast. Consumers right now are absolutely willing to put money down on an all-new vehicle. Now, industry experts don't expect inventory to really ramp up again until the spring at least, and that's dependent on the availability of semiconductors and any lasting impact from COVID-19 and the Delta variant. Nicole? Oh, yeah, if it's not ramping up to the spring, I mean, we're still technically in the summer, so it's, it's going to be a while. All right, Nancy, thank you. Yep. Let's still head tonight on Rush Hour. Disturbing new body camera footage showing police repeatedly punching a group of teenagers. One officer even spits on one of those teens. We'll tell you what led up to this now viral video and what comes next for those officers. Let's take a look at this newly released body camera footage. This is out of Providence, Rhode Island. It shows some tense moments during an arrest last month. Now, community members are outraged at this video because it shows officers punching, even spitting on three teenagers. News Nation's Steph Machado from our station WPRI in Providence went through all of this footage released by the police department. She joins us with the latest on the case. <laughs> The hours of body camera video shows Providence police officers repeatedly punching teenage boys they are arresting in the early hours of July 9th. One teen with his face bloodied. Officer Domingo Diaz, who has been suspended, spits at him as the teen is pulled up from the ground. Diaz, in another video clip, is seen repeatedly punching one of the teens before being physically pulled off of him by a sergeant. The violent arrests taking place after an hours-long chase through the city. The three teenagers in a BMW convertible accused of driving erratically and pointing a BB gun rifle at civilians and police. When they finally crash into a fire hydrant on Salmon Street, police are seen on video pulling them out of the car. More than one officer throws punches. You okay? Yeah. In this clip, an officer interviews the driver, who says he's 15. But bro, like, do you see the severity of this? Like, y y you guys are going crazy, man. The, the whole state was after you guys. Dude, that's why I kept telling them, stop put that out the window, and, and they don't listen. They don't listen. They don't right. listen. You just should have pulled over, bro. You were the driver, man. The three juveniles were all charged, but have not been identified because they're underage. Shortly after the incident, police placed Diaz and Officer Mitchell Voyer on paid suspension. All right, so Steph Machado joining us live now. Steph, we know community members are outraged, but how are local leaders responding? Well, the mayor of Providence and the public safety commissioner have ha called this video appalling. The commissioner saying he did see excessive force in that video, but police have otherwise been pretty mum on this topic because we have a law here in Rhode Island called the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights that prevents them from talking about police misconduct while the investigation is underway. That investigation being done by Rhode Island's attorney general, who says it is substantially complete, so we could hear any day now about potential charges or if these officers will be cleared. Nicole? All right, Steph, we know you'll keep us updated. Thank you. All right, we turn now to a chilling story, this time out of California. A young couple, their one-year-old daughter and their dog, all found dead along a rural hiking trail. And investigators say there are no signs of violence, no signs of foul play, and that it's unlike anything they've ever seen. News Nation's Adrian Thomas from our Fresno station, KSEE, has this perplexing story. Good evening. Authorities and community members are still trying to wrap their heads around this tragedy. The Mariposa County Sheriff tells me there was no signs on scene of blunt force trauma, and he's never seen anything like this in his nearly two-decade career. I've worked in different capacities, but I've never seen uh, 
a death like this. Mariposa County Sheriff Jeremy Breeze says his department won't rest until investigators determine how John Jarish, Ellen Chung, their one-year-old daughter, Muji, and their dog all died while on a hike on Monday. A spokesperson for the sheriff's office says the family was reported missing around 11 p.m. Monday night and discovered around 11 a.m. Tuesday morning. Sheriff Breeze says there are some abandoned mine shafts in the area which can release dangerous gases, but that has not yet been ruled a determining factor. We have not located a mine nearby, but um, in the beginning of the investigation when we put out our release, that's why um, we are taking it um, slower and methodically for the safety of the rescuers. The sheriff also says the trail the family was on had warnings about toxic algal blooms in the Merced River, but it's still too early in the investigation to determine if that impacted the family. At the beginning, there are some signage about some algae blooms, but that's from the Forest Service, and I can't speak to, you know, yeah. the potential dangers there. Adrian Thomas, News Nation. So many questions there. We still ahead tonight on Rush Hour. Facebook hoping to reinvent online meetings with a new virtual reality platform. And Amazon preparing to make the leap from online sales to brick and mortar. Amazon stepping up the competition with Walmart and Target, planning large retail locations across the U.S. And Facebook launching a new app that will let people working from home in reality meet with colleagues in virtual reality. So let's bring in Corey Johnson. He's money manager and host of the Daily Drill Down podcast. So, Corey, what are Amazon's plans for these brick and mortar stores? Well, right after Amazon steamrolls through America, shutting down bookstores because they offer a better offering online then shutting down department stores because they have a better offering online then they roar right back into those communities and, and are now talking about opening stores department stores in ohio department stores in california that will be part of this test they won't be ginormous like department stores of yore but they'll be still be pretty big stores probably 20 to 40 thousand square feet uh and offering all the things that amazon offers but in particular focusing on offering clothing and offering electronics, but the kinds of things that are maybe a better shopping experience uh, offline than online, there is, of course, as I mentioned, that great irony that they uh, caused so much disruption in America by having shops shut down. Now they're going into the physical reality. This, of course, comes on the heels of their acquisition a few years back of Whole Foods and actually being there uh, in physical contact with their customers. I just throw a note of caution, though. You know me. Amazon tries lots of stuff. They throw things against the wall to see if it sticks. That doesn't mean they're right. going to stay with us for a doesn't long time. Doesn't mean it will. And I mean, I think people love Amazon because they get the delivery in like a day, right? All right, Corey, we don't have a lot of time. We want to hit this. So Facebook beta testing a virtual reality app for remote workers. So is this, is face-to-face -face going to be a thing of the past? Look, I think Facebook, when Facebook has grown from $50 billion in revenues just three years ago to over $104 billion in revenues because they want you to be in front of them at all times, including when you're at work. So they're spending billions of dollars in virtual reality. They think that maybe this will work at work. Other companies have had great success with this. There's a great real estate company called EXP Worldwide that has actually always been virtual. It has these reality spaces so your work day can be like a moment of fortnight. Uh, that's what Facebook is hoping you'll have more of when you're sort of at work or working but not at work. I don't even know what you call that. Right. Well, it's and the thing like, is, Corey, like, like us right now. the amount of people that are on Facebook at work, I mean, I still think Facebook has a good handle on that. All right, Corey, we appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the Download Report starts at the top of the hour. Joe is in the studio. Joe, tell us what you're working on. Hi, Nicole. Tonight on the Donald Report, trying to escape Afghanistan. What can Americans and our allies do? We're going to talk to the female journalist, an Afghan journalist from Kabul. She's going to tell us how she's trying to get out. Back here at home, schools are looking for ways to get around mask bans. We'll tell you about one approach they're taking. The question, is it legal? Plus, a salute to a fallen Chicago hero. Emotional pictures today. Could this be a turning point for police and the community? We'll continue our discussion on policing in America. That and much more at the top of the hour. Nicole, back to you. Yeah, an emotional day in Chicago. Joe, thank you. We'll still to come on Rush Hour. One more check on top stories making headlines around your nation, including a decision in the Trevor Bauer restraining order case. And a video guaranteed to make you smile how one man's attempt to relax led to people nearby calling 911.
We continue tonight live from our News Nation headquarters here in Chicago. Here's a look at what's going on in your nation right now. The U.S. struggling to speed up evacuations of Americans and Afghans at the Kabul airport. So far, 7,000 people have been evacuated. The State Department expecting another 6,000 to be flown out soon. Right now, about 5,200 Marines and soldiers are on the ground in Kabul. An L.A. judge striking down a woman's petition to get a restraining order against Dodgers pitcher Trevor Bauer. She claims Bauer choked and punched her during a pair of sexual encounters. The judge, however, called her petition materially misleading. A former teammate of a Miami Hurricanes football player killed almost 15 years ago is now charged with murder. Police say Rashawn Jones was arrested today in the death of 22-year-old Brian Pata, who was shot and killed outside his apartment back in 2006. Jones was never publicly named as a suspect until ESPN published a story last year pointing out missteps in the investigation. And an investigation tonight into pop star Britney Spears after a housekeeper says Spears struck her during an argument over a cell phone. The sheriff is investigating, but tells News Nation there were no injuries and that this is a, quote, very minor incident. Of course, Spears and her conservatorship have been in the news lately. And as always, we do want to leave you with a smile, although this one doesn't really seem like it initially. Just listen to us, though. Tulsa, Oklahoma firefighters called out for a report of a body in a river. The body of this man was on a sandbar, splayed out on its back, didn't appear to be moving. But take a close look. When rescuers reached the body, they discovered he was very much alive. Just happened to be relaxing in the shallow water, just taking a break. Hey, you can see him sit up, and he appears as surprised as those rescuers uh, that they were there. And that just gave me so much joy. That is all for Rush Hour tonight. You can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next up, the Donlin Report, then later tonight on Balance with Leland Vittert, of course, News Nation Prime and Banfield. And a reminder, you can check headlines anytime at newsnationnow.com. Also, make sure you download our free News Nation Now app and have a great Thursday night.